Shalom, Rabbi Jonathan Ginsburg, the Ezra Habanim now is Township Jewish Congregation. Shavuot is over and Memorial Day is coming. And so are the cicadas. What do we draw together as lessons for life about these events? Well, first, Shavuot. Shavuot has many names in the Torah. It's called Chag HaKatsir, the harvest festival, when the wheat harvest is concluded. It's called Chag HaBikurim, the first fruits. Our ancestors were supposed to take the first fruits of the harvest and bring them to the temple in the form of loaves, and there to say an identification paragraph of the Jewish people. Many scholars believe it's the earliest kernel of Jewish history. My father was a wandering Aramean and sojourned down to Egypt and grew mighty and numerous when we were oppressed and enslaved and cried out for help and God took us with a strong hand and outstretched arm and brought us to the land of Israel. And so you take instead of eating, you're so worried about what you're going to harvest and then you harvest and you don't eat right away, you bring it to Jerusalem and you give it to God and you thank God and you identify as a member of the Jewish people. It's also called Chag Shavuot, which means the Feast of Weeks. And there, the Torah says that we have to count every day. We don't do that normally. Days go by, weeks go by, months go by, but this is one time during the year when we have to count day one, day two, day three, week one, week two, all the way to 49 days and seven weeks, reminding us about the precariousness of time and the importance of time. And finally, the name associated today with the holiday is Zman Matan Torah the time of the giving of the Torah. We celebrate it. The rabbis figured out that since the portion begins on the first day of the third month, which is Sivan, and then you add the chronology, you get to the sixth of Sivan. This is the anniversary of the giving of the Ten Commandments. Now the Haftorah is very interesting. Habakkuk, the prophet, writing in about 607 BCE, sandwiched in between the terrible Assyrian Empire and their destruction and conquering of the ten northern tribes, and about to lose to Babylonia, which will conquer Judah and Jerusalem, he writes a very sobering and strong message, reflecting on the meaning of God. He says, there's a time here when there'll be no olives in the olive press, no cattle, no sheep. And yet, he says at the end of the Haftorah, besides all that, yet I rejoice in the Lord, exalt in the God who delivers me. The Lord God is my strength. So here's a man who says to the children of Israel at a time of great sadness and desperation, even though there won't be any sheep and cattle and olives, still exalt in the Lord. God is the source of my strength. And that jives completely well with the main biblical book that we read on the holiday of Shavuot, the story of Ruth. The story of Ruth is a story of a woman named Naomi and her husband and two sons in a time of famine. During the period of the judges, they migrate to Moab in order to be able to eat. And there the two boys marry Moabite girls, and tragedy strikes, and all three men die. So Naomi is left with these two foreign daughters-in-law, and she says to them, listen, you're very nice girls, but you stay here with your people, I'm going back to mine. And Orpha says, okay, fine, and Ruth says, no, she sees something so beautiful in Naomi's religion that she says, I don't want to leave you, and your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. And because of her seeing that and cleaving to Judaism, is the first story of conversion. The rabbis said, as the Bible says, that she becomes the ancestress of King David, from whom the Messiah springs. And so this Moabitess woman becomes then the grandmother, essentially, of the Messiah. So that is the story of Shavuot. And one of the other things the Jewish people observe on Shavuot, as we do three other times during the year, is the Isker, commemorative service. Now, Yisker started in the time of the Crusades in the Middle Ages in 1096 when the Jews of the Rhineland were massacred in huge numbers and the few survivors who wanted to remember them on their anniversary of their massacre. And so they remembered them with Yisker and that tradition spread. So now we remember all of our relatives, uh, our immediate relatives, our relatives and friends, our fellow congregants, the martyrs of Israel, righteous people of all nations on this day. So now we come to America's version of Memorial Day, when we remember the sacrifice of our soldiers who died for the freedom of our great country. It doves tail with the Torah portion this week of Nassau, which has what many call the Pearl of the Torah, the priestly benediction. May God bless you and keep you. May God's countenance shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God's countenance shine upon you and grant you shalom. So what is the message there of God bestowing blessing upon us in wanting us to have a life of shalom, of peace and contentment. 
How do we do that, given the troubles of the world and sometimes our own personal troubles? Well, think about Ruth's losses, her horrible losses. How do you ever recover from that? You can't. Yet she goes on to build a life with Naomi. She gets married and she has children and becomes the grandmother of the Messiah in that way. And think about all of the other blessings. Think about Habakkuk, hungry and desperate, no food for the people, and yet he still cleaves to God. He still says God is the source of his strength. Well, one of the amazing things this year is that cicadas are coming, at least in the Midwest. They come every 17 years, and it dawned on me this week that I'm 51 now. That means this is my fourth series of cicadas. And it's interesting to measure your life by a series of 17 years. The first time they came, I was two months old and don't remember. Then I was 17, a junior in high school, thinking about college and thinking about the future ahead of me. Then I was 34, just a couple years out of rabbinical school, starting my career, starting a family. And now I'm 51 in the middle of my career. And then next time I'll be 68. And then if I'm blessed with another one, I'll be 85. So I may have one or two more cicada cycles ahead of me. These poor little creatures, they live underground, not bothering anybody for 17 years, just feeding for the chance to emerge once for a month to propagate their species and then die. Nebuch, not much of a life. But think about where you were during these 17 years and what you hoped for. And how, and know that the thousands of generations that came before us had cicada cycles too. Uh, they had their own way of explaining their life experience. And you know that we're here for a very short time, longer than cicadas, but in the blink of an eye, in God's lifetime, not as God lives eternally, not very much longer. We know there'll be thousands of generations ahead of us. And so what do we do? And how do we understand our life and our sacrifices and the sacrifices of our ancestors? Well, the words of Habakkuk, the prophet, are the key. What Ruth saw was the eternal grandeur of God. And the message of the Torah, of the giving of the Torah that we celebrate on Shavuot, that is the key. Habakkuk says, despite all these hardships, the key is to see God as the source of my strength. It's God who delivers me to rejoice in the Lord. That's what Ruth saw. That's why Ruth Clove wanted to cleave to Judaism. That's why she wanted to attach herself to this people that got the Torah on the holiday of Shavuot on the 6th of Sivan and spread it throughout the world to make the world based on the Torah, the ideas of God in the Torah. And so in this week, when we put together Shavuot, bringing your first fruits and identifying yourself as a Jew, when we think about our deceased relatives and friends, when we think about the loss, the sacrifice, and the hardship of Ruth's life, when we think about measuring our life in these cycles of 17 years, or however we measure them, the key is to attach ourselves to the one thing that's eternal, to God expressed through the Torah.